Good evening. I'd like to call the April 26, 2018 regular monthly meeting of the Scarborough Sanitary District Trustees to order. Um, roll call. Judith Caballero. Here. Joe Carroll. Present. Audrey Strauss is absent with notice. Ben Viola is absent with notice. Jason Greenleaf. Here. Nick Rico is absent, but I expect him to be arriving shortly. And I'm Charles Anderson. Uh, next item is the approval of the minutes of March 22nd, 2018, regular monthly meeting. Motion to accept. Moved to accept by Joe. Second. Second by Jason. Um, I had a, uh, I just had a couple minor corrections to offer on page two. These are typos. I wasn't at the meeting, but I can offer them. <coughs> Uh, under paragraph E on the third line, located on Pine Point, I think this should be Pine Point Road, at the Eastern Trail. And under paragraph G, the third line down, at the end of that line, uh, ant should be ant, A-N-D. And those are all uh, corrections that I picked up. Any other corrections or omissions to be? All those in favor of the motion to approve. Anyone opposed? I abstain. I wasn't here for the meeting. Uh, okay. I'm going to vote even though I wasn't here because there's no objections okay, from anyone I who vote. was here. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. So it's Make life easy. Four, four yeas, no, no news. Okay, next item, Superintendent Operations Report. David. Okay. Yeah, um, copy of the monthly report of operations for the month of March is including the packet. Our average flow for the month was 1.5 million down today. Our from quality was again within our permitted limits, well within. Uh, we averaged 93 and 97% uh, DOD removal and total suspended solid removal with concentrations of 12 and 5 milligrams per liter. Perfect. Copy of the pump station flows for the month of March is included in your packet. The industrial Park pump station had a high peak flow that the cause eludes us. We, we just uh, feel there was a, a glitchiness going on in the PLC on that one. And then there are a couple with reported uh, zero flows, um, and those are erroneous as a result of power outages that we're experiencing during that time. And the pump station is pumped and operated. Appropriately. Um, on Black Point Road, we had scheduled some um, um, CCTV work to uh, for this week um, to inspect the sewer within the Black Point Road from Highland Ave to the pump station on Old Neck Road. Um, I had posted the notification on our website and also forwarded it on to the Public Works Police Fire and as well as Town Hall. Uh, this has been rescheduled. It's, uh, it's going to take place this coming Monday um, due to an emergency that Ted Berry had to attend to during the, during the week. And that is what I have right now. Good. Uh, next item is correspondence. We have, on uh, behalf of the town of Scarborough, Sebago Technics requested an ability to serve letter for the Proposed 58,500 square foot public safety building. Uh, estimated wastewater flow for that was uh, 2,400 uh, gallons per day. Including your packet as a copy of this request, as, as long, along with uh, the district's ability to serve letter um, that was provided to the town. And the next thing is the uh, DEP's. Uh, letter advising the district that they completed their review of the 2016 compost annual report. Uh, and if they found it uh, complete in meeting all their requirements. That's all we had for correspondence. And it is the review of the 2016 and the 2017. Okay. Uh, old business. Verizon Wireless Cell Phone Tower. 
uh, due to wind, Verizon Wireless had canceled uh, the balloon float that was scheduled on March 31st. They rescheduled the balloon float uh, for April 14th. Uh, and they uh, utilized the crane to get the, the balloon up to the, um, the, uh, the height that they, the 100 foot height that they wanted it to be at. Um, Unitel has uh, has completed the, uh, the planning approval process, is in the process of scheduling the closing day of our property on Eastern Road. Uh, they're working with uh, both myself and our legal counsel. Uh, we continue to have billing issues with CMP and uh, with regard to the bill at the wastewater treatment plant. Our most recent bill was for $422, where typically our bill is between $8,000 and $10,000. Uh, we've notified uh, PUC of this issue and uh, several conversations with CMP as well as with NGI Resources and Constellation Energy to resolve the issue. Um, at some point in time, they're going to figure it out. Uh, yeah. uh, is, do we have any idea how long the time frame we're looking at before they get this resolved, or is it liable to be next year? I can't get an answer from anybody on that. I don't know. Okay. Um, I would have thought it would get resolved at this point. This is, I think, our third month. Okay, so I think what we'll need to make sure we do is kind of earmark these funds um, if, if, if this isn't resolved by year end, just to make a note here to uh, um, for us to make some kind of an adjustment. Um, unless legal counsel tells us that if they don't bill us, we're not liable. I don't see how they can bill us yep. for non-needed power, but... Um, in talking with uh, our energy broker, Constellation Energy, they feel that what happened is uh, CMP swapped out our meter and put the wrong multiplier in, in the meter. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, our <coughs> I assume our, our provider is going to want their money. Um, so I, I, I think from my standpoint, and I think I would agree with the superintendent, I think he's done a great job of reaching out to the PUC and CMP and everybody else trying to rectify the situation. Um, I think it's a wise idea to probably earmark some money, but I think it's uh, also wise for us probably to uh, contact our legal counsel just so they're aware of the, the situation because we've done everything in our best interest to pay them accordingly. And they can't come at us, I would say, much later and expect tens of twenties of thousands of dollars in payment when we try to do it anyway. I'll contact them. And I would just, to, you know, extend my appreciation to the superintendent for trying to do the right thing, even though they don't want our money. <laughs> did, did you send a written notice? We have been providing them documentation of, uh, you know, previous bills, uh, phone calls, sending them, going back. Uh, Wendy's provided. They've asked for certain in, um, uh, bills that they've had, and yes. Okay. So there's there's written documentation yeah. that we've provided. Yeah. Okay. okay. Solar energy. Uh, we have received the solar energy proposal from Revision Energy, which I have included in the, as part of the packet. Uh, per, per our direction, Revision proposed a much smaller system that, um, than the previous provider uh, that will offset roughly 18% uh, of the district energy consumption. Uh, this, this proposed system is looking which has been mounted on all of our roofs within the, uh, the uh, complex at the treatment plant. As noted in the proposal, the district has a very competitive electricity utility rate of six, uh, six cents a kilowatt hour, and they were unable to um, match that rate. And uh, the proposal would require us to purchase the power back at a premium rate of nine cents per kilowatt hour. At that utility rate, and within with an early buyout at six years, uh, the district has a potential savings of. of uh, $60,000 in 25 year lifespan, expected lifespan of the, or the warranty lifespan of the panels, I'm sorry, the panels are warranty for 25 years. 
that equates to about $2,400 a year um, for 1% of our annual electric budget. Uh, and if we get the, the life expectancy of out of the panels of 40 years, it would be uh, the potential of saving $400,000 over those 40 years, um, or 10000 a year, or 4% of our current what those costs don't include is any additional costs that we'd have to incur as a result of removing the panels and reinstalling <coughs> when we have to remove the buildings. Um, and there would be, we would actually be running at a, in the negative up to year 22. Did you ask them to try to meet our current electricity bills huh? with their proposal? So um, with that, you know, I, I can move forward with this uh, uh, this some more, but I don't I don't see that it's really financially beneficial for the district. It would. I think the reasons for moving forward would, for it would be for other reasons. Whether you know, for uh, if, if, if you just want to be part of the solar energy uh, production. So um, I guess I'm looking for direction on, on that right now. Or we come back to it another time. Well, uh, so that, that was one of the questions that I had when reading through your report was unable to meet that rate, was that just a, you know, no counter offer, or was that just, this is a firm, we're not going to be able to meet the, meet the six cents? Yeah, we, they can't meet that six cents. I mean, they, 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 they wanted to. Yeah. Okay. That, that was really the, the, the first thing. And then I knew with the, you know, potential other costs, and it spawned the next question is, are we due for any type of roof replacement? Do you know? Um, uh, the, the roofs are probably, we'll try to figure that out. Um, we had, they're at least eight years old. Okay. I mean, they're not, in, you know, they're not, not on the yet, yeah. but they're, you know, within a few years, you know. Oh, 10, to, 10 to 12 years. Yeah, right? we're, we're replacing those roofs. Right. Which? My recommendation on this would be to hold off. We have a very competitive electric rate right now. Continue. Very competitive. <laughs> Continue with that, um, and maybe the, the market will mature some more. It's matured even over the two years ago when I looked at it. It gotten better. Let's take another look at it a couple, three years down the road. And see if it makes sense at that point. Yeah, I, I don't see any angst of getting behind it. I mean, I like the idea of it, but it's not going to be beneficial. Um, were there any other vendors that were potentially going to offer anything that was really close? I mean, I know the town's using a different vendor. No, they use it. What's they the, are. All right. What's the, bio, what's the buyout amount after year six? Uh, it's approximately $300,000. Right. So we're going to have to find the answer or spend $300,000 to maybe save $400,000 over 40 well, years? Well, Honestly, I don't know how comfortable I am with a projection of a four to 40 years, mm -hmm. but if we're not even breaking even until year 22, or we're negative cash flow until year 22, I just guess I can't see spending three or four thousand dollars and carry that expense for well, the ball 16 years before you get a return on that investment. Right. So. I just think it's hard. I think it's hard. It's, it's hard for me to justify that. Not yeah, yeah, five years. And that doesn't include incidental costs that will confer, or that will uh, incur in the meantime when we do the roof, et cetera. So it just doesn't seem to be financially prudent to pursue this at this point in time. So I, I think I'm on board with the superintendent about mm -hmm. delaying any activity here on the solar nature and let a little, little more time pass and maybe the markets will change. I think it was prudent where the rest of the town is looking at a lot of this and you know, knowing that we had possibly replaced the roof in about five years. So um, we looked into it and I think it's not our best interest. So I agree. Great. So, um,
say, do you need direction, formal direction from us? Yeah, do you need a vote or anything? I don't yeah. think so. Probably, it, it might not hurt because yeah. we've got a formal proposal from a vendor <coughs> here for the board to move to take any action on this for five years. After five years, and then through ask the superintendent to to reevaluate the feasibility of it five years from now, but to advise the vendor that at this point in time we're not we're not eager to move forward. We're not intending to move forward with this. When did you make the my motion? For five years from now? So you're moving in, I just said. <laughs> Thank you. I know you don't like to do that. No. So I just thought I'd just operate your language. So we need a second to do this motion. Second to Charlie's motion is my motion. I'll third that motion. I'll second to Second to so. Any further discussion? No only discussion. So you made the motion, you said. Yes. I just got the idea from the wind. Okay, it includes advising the, the vendor that they're not before. Okay, all those in favor? None opposed. Okay, new business. Uh, first item on it, oh, as we get into new business, um, with the board's, uh, without objection of the new business, I'd like to move item H, the executive session, uh, to follow. Um, item 10 so that we'll adjourn to executive session because there's no action. We don't need to come back into formal meeting. So we'll adjourn to executive session and that will let um, the videotaping of the meeting conclude and you can go home and you won't have to wait for 10 minutes or 5 hours however long it takes us to uh, Okay, so without objection that's what we'll All right, so item A in the new business is the uh, annual audit report and the superintendent's annual report. Okay, uh, Wallet and Associates have completed the 2017 annual audit of the district's financial statements, a copy of which I included, uh, I provided you. Uh, no significant issues or findings were identified. Mr. Dunn from Wallet Associates is here to make a presentation with regard to the 2017 annual audit and, um, and then once he is through I'll make a presentation of the annual report and uh, with that I, I would yeah, recommend before, the, and before we look at I'm sorry so with you, a, you know I would re recommend approval of that. and just by way of explanation because this will be a little bit difficult for folks at home to follow because we've been relocated from our scheduled meeting place because of all the meetings taking place this evening and we don't have the ability in this meeting room to do a PowerPoint presentation that the cameras can pick up. So um, you'll see in the report, folks who have questions are advised to contact the superintendent at our office. And um, so we'll try to make the presentation clear and concise, but I'm sure folks at home will have a little trouble following it. And, and for people's uh, information, the annual uh, audits and annual reports are all uh, maintained on our website and are available just by getting on our website. As soon as this is accepted, a copy of which uh, copy of this will be, be up on, on our website probably tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow. Great. So let's move forward then. Mike. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks again for having me. Um, Basically, what I, we've provided is a copy of the financial statements. Um, you should have those in a sort of bound, bound format. Um, there's also included in those a letter, which is um, a letter to the Board of Trustees. This is a letter that um, we're required to issue as part of the result of the audit and communicating certain areas that we're required to communicate um, as a result. I put together th these PowerPoint slides to first go through the letter, summarize the letter, and also um, through the financial statements sometimes has um, put it th through some graphs in there with some trends, financial trends, to take a, a look at the, the district over a five-year period in most, most cases. Um, and so I'll 
provide you some information as we go through, highlighted information, um, and you may end up flipping through some of the financials to look at. You know, we can, I can entertain those questions. Okay. So the, the first slide I have on the PowerPoint um, is just a, a, an overall overview of an audit. There's, you know, there's many people that, that kind of know what an audit is, but don't really know what an audit is because they don't go through them on an annual basis. Um, so I've just kind of put some bullet points of the purpose of this audit. Um, you know, for the most part, what we are is an independent third-party um, CPA firm that we're hired to come in and perform procedures on the district's financial information. And what that does with our procedures is that we can, we can provide an opinion on the financial statements that they're, you know, clear and accurate. Um, based on that opinion, it, it provides sure, a, assurance for all the readers when they look at that financial information that it's been reviewed by an independent third party. Um, as part of the audit, we also look at the internal controls of the district and, you know, with our experience in auditing multiple um, type sewer or water districts, we can provide some you know, some advice to improve internal controls if we see um, that there should be some improvements made. Uh, the other piece of our audit is that, um, you know, the district follows uh, generally accepted counting principles, um, especially uh, GASB, which is government counting standards, um, to present their financial statements. Sometimes this body presents new technical standards um, or changes to the financial reporting that the district is going to be required to you know, adapt and, and, and adopt and, and change how they report um, their financial statements. Anytime this happens, we will advise management, help them make those, those changes so to you follow the proper accounting standards. So with that, I'm gonna, the first area I'm going to look at with the next slide is looking at this letter to the trustees. It's a governance letter. Basically covers, in, if you look at the letter, it covers some um, um, bolded, italicized areas that were required to communicate. And it's just a result of the audit. The first area is qualitative aspects of accounting practices. And I do have these summarized on the slide. If you just read them the slide. This area talks about three three different um, subjects. One of them is the new accounting policies adopted by the district. Um, the second is significant estimates in your financial statement and also significant disclosures. Um, looking at the first, the significant new accounting policies adopted, um, I'm just reporting to the board that there were no new accounting standards issued or accounting policies adopted. Um, that's important for the board because if there was something adopted, there could be changes in, in what you looked at from last year to this year when you look at the financial statements. <coughs> Significant estimates. We've, we feel um, as part of our audit that you do have one significant estimate as part of your financials. That's depreciation. Um, that's recorded each year as an expense in your, in your financial statements. Um, and depreciation is, is basically, um, if you kind of look at it like you're, you're purchasing a capital asset for the district this year, but you're actually expensing that asset over its life rather than expensing it all in the year you purchase it. So when you look at your financial statements, you're going to see this expense in your financials, um, but really you've already expended it. You've expended it prior years, uh, cash-wise. Uh, but you're taking the expense over that period. So that's the estimate part is how long that capital asset's going to last. So management decides on the length of uh, the life of that and it's depreciated that asset once purchased. So if significant disclosures, currently there has been no new disclosures in the, in the district statements. We don't feel any of these are significant. Most of these are standard disclosures under generally accepted accounting principles, um, and none of them would really lean towards having any significance that needs to be looked at by the board. Most of these, as part of my presentation, we'll, we'll take a look at as we go through the financials. Other areas in this letter, um, looking at page two, 
Um, and I'm just going to kind of go over these real quick. Things like if there was difficulties for us performing the audit or if we had found some corrections and management elected not to make them or if we had disagreements with management, any of those type of issues or even other audit findings and suggestions, this would be our, our way to communicate these directly to the trustees. And you can see when you read down through the letter that we had none of those issues to report. Overall, I think the, uh, the audit went very well, very smoothly. Um, little to know, you know, we had just a few adjustments, primarily in the capital asset area. Um, but other than that, nothing significant to report. Any questions on this letter? We're going to need to make recommendations later, correct? If I'm not mistaken. Excuse me? We're the recommendations later, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, yes. So we take a look at the financial statements. Those are the bound financial statements. And the way this way that I have my presentation set up is kind of go through the financial statements and look at the slides at the same time. That provides the best information. The first slide just looks at the district's financial statements as they're presented. There's been no changes. They're in comparative format, showing 2017 compared to 2016. The first area of the financials is our audit report, our independent auditors report, and that has an unmodified or a clean opinion on it. So no, no issues of qualification in the auditors report. The second area is called management's discussion and analysis. This is management's highlights and, and views on the financial statement. That, that piece is unaudited by us part of management's input to the financials. Next area are the financials themselves. Statement of net position is the first one. That's the assets and liabilities um, and uh, net position of the district. The second statement is the statements of revenues, expenses, and changes in next position. That's, a, that's pretty self-explanatory. Then the statements of cash flows. And also, with those statements, if there are some areas of significance, there are usually a note to, the, to those areas in the notes of financials statements that follow that. Um, the district has elected to include also some summary schedules in the back of operating expenses and also the superintendent's report. So to start off with the financial statements, um, page page 11. I'm going to skip over the uh, management discussion analysis, go to the actual exhibits. Again, the statements in net position show the assets, the liabilities, and net position of the district. First area I'm going to look at is the top half of the schedule, which is the, uh, the assets. And I provided a slide that kind of shows the growth in assets for the, for the district of a, over a five-year period. And just kind of go off and go off the uh, PowerPoint presentation. You can see the inventory and other assets there. There are small amounts at the bottom or base of the schedule. Those, those are pretty standard and similar from year to year. There are some small fluctuations in inventory, but the district usually maintains a standard amount of chemicals and supplies on hand. Anything substantial over in that is usually subcontracted out or purchased at the time of need. Um, other assets would be like prepaid expenses or deposits. Looking at the accounts receivable, um, it's, it's hard to tell with this PowerPoint presentation, but there is some increase in that, but it's pretty similar from year to year overall. That, the accounts receivable is just primarily the user's fees and the um, you know, use of use and billing at, at December 31st from year to year. So as a, as a district grows with, with consumers, that, that receivable will probably grow. That could also change if there's a rate change in the future. Um, looking at investments in cash, um, you can see growth in, in both the cash and investments. Um, 
investments have um, definitely grown. From 2015, it used to be just cash balances. The district started investing into uh, treasury notes in 15, uh, 16 and 17. You've seen a little bit of a growth in that. Um, primarily what you're looking at though are uh, the capacity fees that are that come in from year to year those fluctuate so when there's a year of um, a lot of those fees coming in you're going to see those being put away in the reserves which is primarily your investments any questions on the assets <coughs> I did separate on the next slide capital assets because of the sheer volume of that. It, it, the size, dollar value of that would have skewed the graph the more so was. But you see a downward trend with those, and that is expected. That's the depreciation that occurs every year. Uh, the district has been maintaining um, the system and the structure year to year. It's been about anywhere from $200,000 to $500,000 a year in purchases. However, you'll see the depreciation is, is well over a million dollars, so that's going to show that downward expensing of those capital assets that are purchased each year. Currently still about $22 million is what would have ended at in 2017. The next slide looks at your liabilities. These are primarily your current liabilities, showing areas such as uh, district credits. That's a dark um, column there, and you can see those dropping right down. 2018 should be the last year you receive any of your credits. Those were associated with the bonds that went out. You get some credits on your interest. Um, currently showing in your financials, the deferred credits is about $3,800. It's the last year. 2018, you'll receive those. That's because that bond is going to be paid off. So and that's the last bond, is that correct? Yeah, we have one, one, one other bond. That's so the bond is paid off in 2022. So, that yeah. Be okay. Another four, four years. Four years. Those, yeah, those credits were associated with the first bond. So those will be those will be gone after that. Um, crude interest. That's also you can see a downward trend. That's kind of the brown column, dark brown column. That goes down, obviously, as, as bonds or any financing goes. The longer it goes out, the more principals being hit rather than interest. So that's, a, that's an expected trend there. Um, crude payroll, you can see that's kind of climbed up in 2016 and now dropped, I believe, in 2000. If you look at 2015 and 2017, that's where my expectation is, is where it should be on the accrued payroll. 2016, there was some extra accrued in that um, because of a retirement. I was just saying, thanks, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That, that, that's only going to really fluctuate, though, if you have employees, changes in employees or, or rates for the employees. But for the most part, that should be a standard accrual based on the year end. Um, the same with accounts payable. Um, there was some growth this year in your accounts payable due at the end of the year. There was some furniture and fixtures that were purchased that was, you know, it's unusual. Added a few extra payables, meaning they purchased it, it's just the bill wasn't paid at the end of the year. It was paid just after the end of the year, so it was a, it was a proof for that. <coughs> but again, I, I know these, the, the way the graph looks is a little different, but if you look at the left, you're only talking about $70,000. Total, your total current liabilities is only 955000 820 of that being your bond payable piece. So there's not a lot of current liabilities on the district's books. And to take a look at that, I've prepared a couple more slides looking at your current ratio. The current ratio uh, simply is can the district cover the current liabilities with the current assets they have? Um, looking at, I've, I've got two separate slides primarily because, again, in 2015, the, the cash accounts that were used for reserve funds were moved to investment accounts. So they basically moved out of the cat, current asset category, but where I have a five year trend, 
I, I elected to have two separate ratio sheets. So as the, when they were cash accounts, and they aren't restricted, they're designated, so they can be changed by the, by the board of trustees if needed. Um, they're not restricted by an outside party. Um, but you're looking at you know, ratios of you know, right around 4.3 to 4.7, 2.4, 3.1. These are all meaning that the district can cover its liabilities multiple times, which is a strong position. Um, you can cover those, li those, those liabilities, and that basically pays all the liabilities of the district except for the bond. So that's a very strong position. And the next slide basically takes out the, um, the cash, per se, uh, that was for, takes out all the reserve funds. And you're just looking at cash balance in the current liability, the current assets compared to the current liabilities. So you do see some, even over the five year trend, the district is improving its current ratio, even taking all of those investments and reserve funds out of the, out of the calculation. So you're up to a 3.1 3 to one. That's yeah. fairly healthy, is it? 3.1 That's very, very, very healthy. healthy, yes. Yeah. Any questions on that? Just to, before we get into the net position, just to back up, um, if we do want to look at the long-term liabilities for the bond, we can we can look at page 19 of the financials. That gives the um, 19 and 20, I should say. That's the note disclosure for the bonds. Shows the the ending balances as of 12:31:17, and also uh, on page 20, the maturities expected maturities of the bond um, over the next five years and thereafter, um, which is useful for, for budgeting purposes. So you can see that first year, 2018, you've got, a, you've got a heavy year on principal payments, but that's because you're paying the remaining part of that second, that first bond off. Then you'll just have left over the second bond. What is that table here? Well, you're required to show um, five years, um, and then usually we, we put a thereafter is a normal note disclosure. But where your bond ends in 2027, we just left it. We just put that in there, inserted that instead of the thereafter. Okay. Um, but there's only there's only basically one more year, you know. So we just put that five year gap in there. Next year, that'll probably go away. Anything else? Net position, that's at the bottom of page 11. Currently, the district's net position is $24,865,000. Um, it's, it's divided into two sections, investment and capital assets, net of debt, and unrestricted. I've put it together a PowerPoint um, slide to kind of break that out a little bit more. Um, normally when, uh, when someone looks at their equity or net position, you think that that's available money to spend $24 million. Really, if you look at it, there's about $19 million of it that's invested in the capital structure. So it's unspendable. It's your fixed assets, your capital assets. Other than that, the, the uh, 5.7 million that's unrestricted and basically liquid. You have 4.1 million of that that's board designated. Those are the reserve funds, which are primarily investments. Uh, the other portion of 1.6 million is unrestricted and available. I put together a, uh, a couple slides here of revenue trends, looking at the user's fees. Um, definitely some growth, I think, uh, and, and also looking at um, page 12 of the financial statements of revenues, expenses, and changes in that position. Shows the revenue expenses. Expenses are on a 
um, cost center basis. There are details of these expenses in the back of the financials, pages 21 and 22 if you want to look at it as base hold and um, supplies and those type of things. Looking at the revenue trends though, just the user fees, you had about a $100,000 increase compared to last year, which is a good growth over the, over the past year. Uh, and you can see over the five years, the district has been doing well with those fees in, in growth. Um, just to kind of show the trend as it's going. The, the, the next slide shows all the other revenues, which are, which are primarily just septic and permit and inspections and other type of revenues like that. You can, I just put together a slide to show you the trends on those. Um, there's about $70,000 a share of, of other revenue types included there. Um, so that's just, that's just for your, your viewing. The capacity upgrade fees at the bottom, uh, close to the bottom of page 12, that had a significant increase this year. That was up about a million dollars. Um, these are these are outlined in the management discussion and analysis. Um, there is a schedule in there that, that shows all the individual um, capacity upgrade fee upgrade fee payments. That's page nine. It's, it's in the beginning of the financial statement. That gives you an idea of um, some of the growth of the businesses available there. Taking a look at the cash flow statement on page 13 and, and 14, I think this is kind of a kind of a significant statement, especially for readers of the financials that are not used to looking at some of these types of numbers. Um, key areas I like to look at is how these are grouped. The first area on page 13 is cash flows from operating activities. Next one is cash flows from investing, and and then cash flows from capital and related. There's a supplemental schedule on page 14 that it kind of ties out the operating activities in a different way, um, you know, which I think is something key to look at. And the reason why this is important is because the, the district overall for operations, if, if you looked back at the, at the previous um, statement of revenues, it showed a $253,000 operating loss. However, your cash went up $700,000. So there's a couple key um, areas in there that should be understood as why that would happen because normal person, if, if they lost $200,000, you'd think their checkbook would be down $200,000. But when your checkbook goes up $700,000, you know there's a couple other things going on in there. Um, the first one kind of explains it on page 14. Though, although there's a $250,000 loss, you see the first major area there is depreciation. Again, that's, a, that's an expense that's causing that loss, but it's really not a cash expense. So when you add that back, you actually can see that from operating activities, um, the, the cash flows from operations for the district was about $1.3 million. Taking that number, you can go back to page 13 and see that same number at the top kind of grouped into a little bit different categories. So what, what, the, what happened with that 1.3 million for the district? Well, if you look at these two next areas, especially the one down at the bottom, the financing, you can see that 1.1 million went to purchasing some capital assets, um, also paying off the bonds and interest. I mean, that was 1.1 million of that, that where that operate, operations went. The big influx was from, from primary, primarily in the middle there, your, your capacity upgrade fees. Although most of that went into your investments, per se, there is a section of your investments that is just cash. They have cash accounts as part of the investment accounts. So as part of um, you know, gov um, generally accepted accounting principles, you need to reclass that up into your cash category because it is actually cash, even though it's in an investment account. So when you look at your investments um, as part of your statement of financial position, it's showing about $2 million. Really, those reserve accounts have about $4 million in them overall. 
that kind of explains more of how that increase in the cash happened was primarily those capacity upgrade fees that came in. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Um, to quickly go through the notes, just to give you a brief overview, page 15 through 17, these are the, the accounting policies of the district. None of them have changed. Um, just talks about things like how they recognize revenue, investments, accounts receivables, supplies. Um, there is a note on page 17 that talks about your investments, fair market value, which they are primarily treasury notes. 18 and 19 shows the changes in your capital assets. Uh, kind of breaks out that number into where some of those additions and retirements are made for 2017-2016. Again, 19 and 20 are the bond notes. And then following that are some additional disclosures such as pension plans and um, concentrations that the district may have. Again, following that are the schedules for operations. So other than that, any other questions on those financials? So the, the only question that I really had, and I don't know if it's more for the superintendent than yourself, was uh, just looking at the capacity reserve um, and the operating revenues. Um, the capacity reserve is truly a different account, correct? Yes. It, it me, I'm a little still new to the, to the forum. Um, and so if I'm looking at page 12, Under operating revenues, those are totally separate than what I'm seeing on page nine for capacity reserve fund. Cap capacity reserves are now by a thumb. Uh, the 1.2. Yes. Capital contributions. Capacity that goes revenues. into the capacity reserve fund, yep. So, all right, that's what I was anticipating. The only question I had was, what was the difference between the $2 million, $2.8 million fund and the uh, 1.2? I, I was lost. Oh, I'm I was sorry. Lost in the map. Yep. No, I know exactly where it where. So, to give you an idea of what I just kind of said previous to that was, the the reserve the reserve funds that the district has invested it has both treasury notes and also a cash a cash account involved with each fund. So, in order to present those correctly, you have to move the cash up with the cash. So if you look at the statement of um, financial position, uh, net position, that cash and cash equivalents at the top, 1.8 million, is only really about 625,000. That's actual operating cash. The rest of that 1.2 million that's in there is cash accounts associated with those reserve funds. So directly affected to probate so, fees. Yeah. So the, the, two, the true 2.8 is really buried in that. That was, that was yeah. kind of really gross. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Confused with the two dollar amounts, I wasn't really sure where that sat. Because I, I assumed it wasn't in operating fees and user fees. I thought that was a separate count. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I didn't fall asleep when I was reading this. <laughs> I just thought I was reading it. I don't know how you fall asleep. <laughs> it's very exciting. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> That's where I really was looking for was yeah. where this, where the, the obviously the cash capacity reserve fees have done very well by the district and been important for. I mean, we, we're seeing very financially healthy, like you mentioned, but we have a lot of potential infrastructure stuff they have to deal with. So, um, and that's going to help us. So, um, how long are we doing by doing capacity reserve fees? A long time since 1987. Oh, wow. All right. Okay. Yeah, when the, occurred, kind of when the so. expansion occurred, some of that was used at that point, so it dropped them down. Yeah, so when we did the expansion in 2011 and 12, of, uh, 2012 they were about, so when we issued the bond, right? Yeah. Um, and we covered half of the expansion out of capacity reserve fees, so 10, almost $10 million out of capacity reserve fees and borrowed 
and borrow the balance. And that's basically what the capacity reserve fee was intended to do, was to have was to have new businesses that weren't planned on, uh, new development that was not planned on at the time the facility was built, to provide cash so that the existing users of the system didn't have to fund 100% of the additional capacity that was needed. So they worked with us about 50% uh, we wanted, and 50% was paid for directly by the users. And it makes sense because when you do the next increment of building, you don't just build for what the, for what the sure, of course. new demand is proposed. You have to build extra, and that's what the district has to fund. So when the, there's an increment of construction that makes sense to do to provide additional future capacity, and so that component of it was what, in, in essence, what, we, what the district funded, and the component that was the, the demand from the new users was paid for by those capacity reserve fees, and that's been our philosophy, and that'll be our, uh, that'll be a hope that the next time we have to do something major like that, it'll, it'll come out close to the same. Uh, it keeps the financing down for the district. And yeah, the user. Yeah, the user. I appreciate the education. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, you know, I only had one question. It, it was dealing with the <coughs> dealing with the change in the ratios from 2015 to 2016, and then back to 2017 on your chart. Yep. I just wasn't sure uh, what caused the dip from 4.7 to 2.4, and then back to 3.1. Was there an was there an adjustment that we made? Yes. Money, right? Yeah. I mean, before the reserve fees were just kept in a standard cash account. Okay. So they were up in current assets, and in 2016, when they went into the investment accounts, they've been moved down into an other asset. Account. Okay. That's how they're okay. coming. So then let's show a little bit of Right. Thank you. Um, so there's no management letter associated with this, which means you're pretty happy with. Yes. Uh, yeah. Normally we do this through a management letter if we found uh, what we call either a significant deficiency or material weakness. We didn't have any of those. Um, if there were any other type of suggestion, that I guess as an auditor we'd say would be at a lower level, just a common suggestion based on our experience with other auditors. Some of that we, we, talk, we talk to management as we're doing the audit and make those recommendations, maybe um, you know, questions on an ongoing basis. But if there's something that we feel is um, significant enough that the trustees should look at, um, we certainly would put that in a letter. Um, you know, especially if if I'm not attending a board meeting as well, mm -hmm. um, that would be something I'd want to put in writing. We didn't have any of those this year. Um, I guess I could add that I was um, I was given by by Wendy and David a, a letter from main main municipal employees uh, on Gasby 75, which is a new stand coming out. Um, and just to kind of give you just a real quick overview of that, of kind of the industry, the government industry that's going on. Not only post-retirement benefits, but now post-health benefits are becoming an, uh, a, a required liability that's to be reported on districts and, and well, I should say any governmental entities' accounts. Um, you can probably see those, a lot of those have been implemented, especially if you're under um, <coughs> main peers, which a lot of districts are, uh, as a multi-employer plan. Uh, they require, they, they have an actuary look at their plan every year um, and they issue certain liabilities that are supposed to be recorded on the district's books. This district is not a member of Maine Peers, so you don't, you're not a part of a multiple employer plan, but if you even had your own plan per se, there are some, some of the larger districts in the state that have their own personal plan. They have to have an actuary come out, and that liability of all their employees, future liability, has to be reported as a liability on the books. And you've seen that on a lot of municipalities. 
this letter that come that came out now is Gasby's next step because the first phase was pensions. Now you're looking at health benefits. So if you're going to offer health benefits to retirees, this is going to be a liability that will be recorded because you'll have to have that actuarially looked at if you have that type of plan. I don't think you have any of your benefits paying retirees health. So no. this letter doesn't, I didn't think apply based on my understanding. So, but I thought I ought to just bring it up to, to let you know what's out there right now for some of the new guys who's coming through. Uh, those type of those type of issues, the GASB, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board feels is important primarily when you go out to bond, that all of your liabilities are on the books and then you're rated properly. Um, and that's, that's the reasoning for changing those accounting standards and having those reporting standards now present. Okay. Uh, my last question isn't really, isn't really about the financial statements, but it's mm -hmm. kind of a general question yep. about your experience with dealing with other similar types of entities, wastewater treatment facilities, districts. Yep. Um, and, and I guess I'm just curious um, how those other districts uh, deal with their um, depreciating assets and mm -hmm. how they fund the ultimate replacement of those assets. Is there any, yeah, for a while there was some guidance coming from Washington that was trying to give direction mm -hmm. to uh, wastewater treatment uh, facility operators right. um, about having to set money aside in reserve at, at certain levels to pay for replacing assets at some future yep. date. Um, we, we uh, will continue to fund our funded depreciation reserve to try and set monies aside to uh, help us to pay for those. But is there any is there any other mechanisms that other agencies are using to try to set money aside to deal with that? Well, from, from what I see, um, it's all over the board. So there isn't really a set method or agency that I've seen that anybody's used. I think a general rule of thumb that um, is maybe just a piece of make, maybe your decision making is, you know, what is your depreciation on an annual basis? So in looking at that, what are you investing in that year back into your equipment? So for instance, this year, I don't even remember what your depreciation was, say it was a million dollars. Um, and you spent 300000 investing in the new equipment. So if you're putting away a reserve, something similar in between there to kind of come close to the million dollars, I think you're doing, you're doing what you're supposed to do. If you're expensing a million and then buying 300000 and putting away 600000 I think that's probably a, a reasonable approach. Mm -hmm. um, the... The difficult thing with this district is that you have a fairly new facility, so you have a larger depreciation, and you may not actually be experiencing that type of expenditure, you know, right off um, to take care of, but um, on an annual basis. But I think just like depreciation, um, showing those assets decline, I think probably the same type of reverse. Um, look at the trend should be how you fund it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at, at the beginning when you have a brand new asset, it doesn't look like you need to put away much to, because you have a brand new asset, but as it gets older, you'll probably have to swing that around and, and invest more into that. Well, we're using straight line depreciation, right? So Correct. what we would show would be equal, equal depreciation from year to year to year. Right. Okay. So, yeah. all right. So, yeah, I was trying to get a little bit of insight yeah. from you. No, I mean, I, I've, I've seen that method. I've also seen some districts um, continually updating a five, ten year plan of what they feel they need to replace, um, using that as, a, as something to budget um, for a replacement reserve mm -hmm. rather than, I, I think that would be similar to a depreciation reserve, a replacement reserve, um, doing ten year 
five, 10, 15 year projections on, especially your underground structure, um, what streets haven't been done, that type of, that type of aspect. Um, you know, everything above ground is probably fairly a lot easier than what's underground. Uh, to be able to Appreciate your uh, depth of your presentation. Apologize to viewers at home who couldn't follow the <laughs> charts that were referred to, etc. Uh, maybe next year, maybe next year we'll do better because we have our meeting on. Uh, <laughs> I just had one last question. Sure. I, I thought you mentioned earlier on that you had some recommendations. I, I said if uh, if we did, it'd be in the letter. All right, so it's not. There's many. Okay, so thank you, Mike. Um, and, and you don't have to stay. You can you can pick up and make your way out. Uh, thank you. 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 Dave, why don't you take a few minutes just to go over your, uh, summarize your annual report. Yep. And then we'll be... Again, it will be just as um, hard to follow for the viewers, but it will be available on online um, uh, tomorrow. So, um, in uh, 2017, we had um, a total of an increase of 65 sewer accounts, bringing us up to 52, uh, 5,219 accounts, of which uh, the vast majority is residential, 4,800 4, approximately. <coughs> the remaining are commercial. Um, we had a pretty good uptick in uh, sewer permits this year. Um, uh, we've got 167. We had 167 total permits, up uh, about 50 from the year before. Uh, the, uh, uh, the number of permits issued, uh, you keep track of uh, the type from single family to, uh, which was the majority of them, but we also reissued permits for uh, repair and placement and demolition and uh, uh, those types of things. So those are all part of that. Um, this past year, we had a total of um, uh, infrastructure added to the system of about 3,300 feet of private uh, gravity sewer, including 24 manholes. Uh, on the public side, we had about uh, we had uh, 3,400 feet of uh, public gravity sewer added in, in uh, 29 manholes, 530 feet of low pressure sewer main, and then. Uh, um, about uh, 40 sewer service connections. Uh, so, in all, we have a total of about 360,000 feet of gravity sewer that we maintain um, throughout the collection system. And uh, in addition to that, there's 124,000 feet of force main, over 2,000 manholes, we have 23 pump stations plus the treatment plant, which is designed for a total of 2.5 million gallons a day. Outside of what the district manages, uh, it's, there's um, approximately 35,000 feet of private sewer lines and about six miles of, uh, six and a half miles of private force mains and 34 private pump stations. So all of those are pumping into our system and uh, contributing to it. Um, in 2017, uh, we had a uh, um, staff reorganization uh, via attrition. We had a senior, the chief plan operator, retire uh, this past year, and we took this opportunity to reorganize and to, at the same time, do a pilot test of uh, sludge hauling versus continuing with the composting operation that we've been doing. Um, that pilot test is still ongoing. We'll go uh, in, um, a few more months, and then I'll be bringing it to the board to decide whether we want to continue with it, return back as compost it. Our flows have been fairly consistent over the last few years. Uh, we've, uh, the, in 2017, we had a flow of 1.34 million gallons per day on average. Uh, the year before that was 1.24, a little uptick. 
that some of that variation is as a result of um, just uh, seasonal rainfall. Um, in going back 10 years, our flow was actually uh, as high as 1.52, but we did some infrastructure repair, which removed some uh, uh, miscellaneous infiltration and flow that was getting into our system, which uh, was causing that increase in flow. Uh, septage receives actually went down fairly significantly by 100,000 gallons this past year. Uh, no real rhyme or reason why. Uh, we had no price changes uh, over the last uh, several years. It's, um, it's just some of the haulers are ch uh, changing uh, uh, with the way they do business, and uh, one major hauler actually uses a, a trailer truck. Uh, that he fills on his site and then hauls where it gets it at a much cheaper rate. So that's probably the primary reason. Um, let's see, I talked about composting a little bit. Uh, we did compost about 1,400 cubic yards of sludge in, um, uh, in 2017. And uh, with that, we added about 18 cubic yards of amendment. You know, those numbers are down compared to previous years because of that pilot testing that we're going on. And over the past year, we did some uh, major, not major upgrades, we did some uh, uh, facility upgrades, including installing a small horsepower aeration tank blower, which is uh, really uh, pulling its weight to improve our overall efficiency, energy efficiency at the plant. Uh, we installed an odor control unit on station number two, new sludge pumps. Uh, we negotiated a lower electric rates for our small, smaller accounts. Um, drafted a <coughs> fat oil and grease policy. We started the sludge hauling pilot test and the restructuring of district staff. And we upgraded um, our pump station alarming and monitoring system. Um, and so moving forward this coming year, we have some goals that we're uh, looking to, um, to meet, and that includes updating our sewer use regulations, fi finalizing our, our fat oil and grease policy, implementing a new billing software program, upgrading our phones at the treatment plant, um, uh, installing new HVAC system within the admin building, uh, formalizing our asset management plan, um, and continue with our process optimization and staff development and uh, set aside capacity reserve fees and complete the installation of the odor control system down at home station one. Um, in closing, I think it's been a really good year. We've, uh, the plant has been running very, very well, very, very efficient, and um, you know, I continue uh, looking forward for another successful year like we had last year. Any questions? I just have a couple questions. Sure. sure. Um, so as far as, as far as formalizing your asset management plan, are you looking at doing like a five or ten year thing like we were just talking about a minute ago, with like uh, equipment and so on and so forth for capital improvement? Or? I already do that. I, I do the five year projection as as best as you know, you, you think it's not that far, but it's still it's right around the corner. Yeah, it, go, it goes right around the corner, but then you go to the next year and it's already changed. Um, <laughs> sure, of course. But you know, the, the, the asset, asset management it is a much bigger animal than that five year planning. Um, it, 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 the first piece of it really is getting a good accounting of what we have for assets, expected life of those assets. And I think that's going to do go a long way to help us plan for what we need to put away for monies um, to replace it. So a true life expectancy of everything we have. Um, how is everything going with uh, the DGRs and staff? I mean, you guys still find that efficient, or are you guys in need? No, it, it's working well with the, the pilot testing program that we're going on because it, you know one of the major pieces of that was labor. Right. Sure. Um, and. You know, and so it, our staff staffing is working well. I don't I don't feel understaffed <coughs> or overstaffed. Okay. Really. All right. The guys just sit there. Huh? It's a joke. I was gonna say the guys just sit there, but no. Yeah. All right. No, no. It's just good to know because it's through attrition, it's a trial. 
Yeah. If you guys are feeling strained, that's something for us to yeah. help you with. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Ladd. No, but I uh, just want to compliment you on a nice, concise summary of the activities of the, of the past year and the goals that we're looking forward to. Um, and I agree with you. I think it was, a, I think it was really a good year operationally for the district, and financially for the district. I think the uh, job with the staff and morale and dealing with that issue. So, um, just congratulations on that. Um, we need a motion to accept the financial report for 2017 and 16, and the superintendent's 2017 annual report as the district's 2017. Annual report. So moved. Second. Move and second. Any more comments or discussions? All those in favor? None opposed. Thank you. Um, we have a gentleman sitting here. Um, does he have an agenda item? Yes, he has an agenda item. Oh, jeez. <laughs> 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 it's the last uh, for him. Uh, 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 <laughs> which is the main <laughs> medical center? That is the main uh, medical center. So, so without, that's objection, that's without objection, I would like to take uh, item F on the new business out of order. Uh, yes, good. I thought you were here helping. And that would be 100 Campus Drive. So, David. Okay, on behalf of Maine Medical Center, uh, SMRT is requesting district approval to connect and discharge into the sewer of the sanitary wastewater from a proposed 4,050 square foot building addition. As described, the project consists of a 4,050 square foot addition to the existing building at 100 Campus Drive and will support the existing outpatient oncology surgical services. New sanitary flows and existing flows um, from the adjoining building will be directed to an existing six inch sewer service exiting the building south side to an existing lane in the parking area. The wastewater is conveyed to the district sewer approximately 1,700 feet away through a private sewer system. MMC holds an easement for the perpetual use of this private sewer. The existing facility is currently approved for 6,972 gallons per day. Uh, they are requesting an additional 464 gallons per day of wastewater flow. I recommend approval with the following conditions. The wastewater is just discharged is limited to 7,436 gallons per day of wastewater. Uh, oh, wastewater characteristics to be as defined in the, the current sewer agreement. Any future flows in excess of the approved limitations are subject to additional approvals and fees. The capacity reserve fee is based on typical wastewater characteristics. Uh, the current capacity reserve fee is $15.95 per gallon and is adjusted monthly based on the engineering news records construction cost index. Based on the current ENR index, the total capacity reserve fee due is $7,400.80. The capacity reserve fee is due prior to issuance of the sewer permit. Any wastewater discharge above the approved discharge limits are subject to additional approvals in capacity reserve fees. Uh, this is the, the one item that I edited um, from the packet and I emailed the revision. It's uh, with regards to the private sewer. The private sewer from 100 Campus Drive to the district sewer shall be inspected via CCTV in accordance with national standards and within three months of obtaining a uh, the building permit. Any noted deficiency shall be repaired uh, within 12 months of obtaining uh, that building permit. Copies of the uh, inspection report and documentation of repairs shall be provided to the district. Sewer permit is required. Uh, the current sewer agreement shall remain intact. And final plan signed and stamped by a licensed professional engineer shall be submitted to the superintendent for the approval for the permit. And finally, the uh, Professionally surveyed uh, uh, CAD drawings, stamp PDF and CAD drawings, and stamp paper copy of the um, submitted to the district upon completion of the project. And we have a gentleman here from SMRT if you have any questions or if you want to address to the board. My only uh, question, thank you very much. I'm Mark Johnson, I'm a landscape architect with SMRT here on behalf as the agent for the, uh, the Applicant Maine Medical Center. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Um, just when in the process is the sewer permit uh, to be issued? What's that? What sewer question? permit? What about the? When is that 
issued in the process? Um, it, if it gets approved by the district, uh, this, uh, by the trustees, um, and you come, you put an application together, fill out the application with capacity reserve fee, and uh, you can issue it right off. Okay, so relative to a uh, building permit, or, or I, I'm just trying to get a sense of chronology here. Typically, they require you to have the sewer permit in hand before they will issue the building permit. Thank you. Uh, and that requires the, them to deliver the final stamp plans to you prior to yeah. the issuance of that permit. Yeah. So you, you, have to, you have to complete your plans, stamped, finalized, and those should accompany your application for the sewer permit. Okay, great. And then the as-built, obviously, at Emily, yeah, yeah. as I recall, the town needs as-built as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um. Would you like to sit on, sit over there to be No, we're good. Okay. We're good. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, My only other possible request is um, the reason, the reason the concern about and, and, and the need for the uh, scoping the line uh, and whatnot is due to excess infiltration that's been, as a result of routine testing, um, found to be in the system. Um, my client is, is passing through, uh, passing influence through a private system before it gets to the municipal system. Um, And I guess my request would, our, our request would be that, that there is notification to that private system owner that there are issues and that we are going to be try, going to be affecting repairs. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I mean, I don't think that's going to be a problem when the when the final when the final inspection is done and that information is submitted to us. Um, if there's deficiencies in that private system, uh, we'd be able to detail detail those to the owner mm -hmm. of the system and tell them that we're expecting the repairs to be made. And I think at this point. Your client is the one who's going to be responsible for Correct. upgrading or uh, doing the improvements, whatever they are that are necessary. And then, if there's issues, uh, I mean, I assume that you have your, that your client has a agreement with the owner of the private system that you're feeding into that deals with yes. any kind of any kind of price prop, uh, cost um, sharing or maintenance responsibility. That or that's a really good question. But that's something that the district won't be directly involved with. Absolutely. Other than other than s confirming the fact that yes, that we can provide with the inspection report. And you might want to provide a copy to the owner of the private system if there's going to be discussions between the client. And Absolutely. About that. Absolutely. And I, and I guess where my concern kind of stems out of is if you look at the private system, it's, it's a dendritic system coming down to a final uh, a discharge point. We are one of those. We, we flow through one of those channels, if you, if you mm -hmm. will. My, my thinking, if I put on Mr. Superintendent's hat, is that if there is infiltration in one of those branches, there's infiltration prospect. So is your concern is your concern of your your flow because like, of the flow of infiltration? My concern is cost sharing. Well, the cost sharing is going to be between your client and the owner of the private system. Exactly. exactly. We're not going to be yes. we're not going to be enmeshed in that. Right. Um, but we will we will communicate with the owner of the private system when we have the inspection results, and we can communicate the, with them earlier to indicate that we're having the inspection done, and expect that they'll be cooperative with you and your client. That's the goal. That's the goal. And and your yes, assistance in that would be okay. greatly appreciated. 
All right, so I don't think that requires any change in motion. So we have the superintendent's recommendations. Do we have a motion? Uh, I no. make a motion we approve with the caveats attached to the superintendent. Okay. Motion to approve with the conditions recommended by the superintendent. Second. Second. Second by Judy. Any other discussion? All right, all those in favor? I have an interest in so much. Sorry, I didn't get you before the report. I actually I actually lost sight of you sitting down in the pond over I, there. Well I I um you're in a Okay, thank you. You can leave that open. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay, the next item is uh, item B on the new business, pump station number two, water main extension. Okay. I, I have met with uh, Main Water Company and had plans drawn up to meet their needs. Uh, Risperia is ready to begin this work. It attaches the agreement with Main Water Company, which is required to, um, uh, which is able to required to extend the, this water main um, and all to make a payment of $8,836 to him. Main Water Company to cover their cost. Uh, I recommend authorizing uh, the superintendent to execute these documents. This is all within the uh, budgeted item for this main extension. It's, it's, it's all considered. And, and it's within the budget. <laughs> Very nice. Motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Uh, the only question, Dave, would be we had talked about the provision of water service to our neighbor at Pump yep. Station 2. Um, you want to just give us a quick, quick explanation to the board about what we're going to do there? Yeah, the, um, what, we're, we're, what we're doing is uh, we're extending the water main from Primrose Lane Road down to our pump station at the Eastern Trail. Uh, past couple of years, we have actually um, borrowed or purchased water uh, through uh, the adjacent land butter of our property, uh, Mrs. Snow, um, and she's been very kind to us all these years and let us do what we needed to do. Um, we can't extend her water main because it dates back to 1929 or something like that, or at least they think. Um, and so one of the things that we will probably do is uh, when we do our service, uh, when, when we do our main, we'll also provide her a service yeah. across the street that we'll just stop out for her. Yeah. And, then, and then if she chooses to utilize the new service, that will be, that'll be her choice from that point on. Okay. Great. 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 Did we get a read it? Okay. okay, any other discussion? All in favor of the motion? None opposed. Eleven, okay. Black, 11 Black Point Road. Road. Sorry. <laughs> um, this uh, waiver of foreclosure is needed in order to protect the district's uh, best interest with regards to this property. The town. Um, already has a lien that takes priority over the district. And we have an agreement with the town that guarantees payment prior to its release. They're recommending authorizing the treasurer to execute this waiver of automatic foreclosure of sewer rates. What does that mean? Um, oh, okay. So, we have a lien against the property. There's a lien against the property. The town, the town is foreclosing for non-payment of taxes. We need to waive our lien position uh, on the property because they owe us also. Because they owe us also. But the town, the but the town gotcha. has made a commitment to us that if we release the lien and simplify the process, that they will pay. I got you. They will be sure yeah. that we get paid. So. Good. Uh, we've done this before with the yeah. town. It's sure. kind of common practice for us. Oh, okay. Good. So we just need a motion to motion go for it. Okay. Second. Second. Isn't that great. Motion and a second. Any other questions? If not, all in favor? None opposed. All right. Next item D is Fort Stewart Drive, Dunstan Village. 
On behalf of Dunstan Properties, Spagel Technics is requesting district approval to connect and discharge into the sewer the sanitary waste water from the proposed 2,776 square foot building. The building will house an office and a salon, both uh, basically cut the building in half. The salon will have four chairs based on 40 gallons per day per 100 square foot of office space, 50 gallons per day per chair. The waste water flow is estimated at 256 gallons per day. The building will be sewered via a private sewer extension. This extension will consist of 173 feet of 8 inch PVC sewer and one manhole. I recommend the approval with the following conditions. The wastewater discharge is limited to 256 gallons of typical sanitary wastewater based on district standards. Any future flows in excess of these approved limits are subject to additional approvals. The capacity reserve fee is based on typical wastewater characteristics. The capacity reserve fee is $15.95 per gallon and is adjusted monthly based on the ENR. Based on the current ENR index, the total capacity reserve fee due is $4,083.20. Uh, $4, this is due prior to issuance of the sewer permit. Uh, any discharge above uh, these limitations are subject to additional approvals and fees. All just applications must be signed by the owner, not an agent. Uh, detectable underground marking tape trace OR uh, shall be installed in accordance with district standards on the sewer service. service. Um, both a sewer extension and sewer connection permit is required because of that small age extension. Uh, Inline hair strain is required downstream from all hair washing basins or similar equipment. And the monthly <coughs> deposit samples of combined wastewater is required, of which will be tested for BOD, COD, and TSS and ammonia. pH data must be provided to the district monthly. The superintendent has the right to modify the sampling program as needed to ensure representable data is obtained. Final plan signed and stamped by a licensed professional engineer provided to the superintendent prior to issuance of the permits and then uh, the record drawings be provided, uh, the geo reference CAD drawings along with the uh, stamped PDF drawings. Any other questions? Motion to approve. So moved. Second. 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 Moved and second. Um, the uh, the sewer extension permit. Um, we we only require feedback from the planning board for extending outside the That's what's in our service area. Right? So we're, we're we're good there. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of the motion. Okay, item E, on the new business, 700 Gallery Boulevard, lot 7. Okay. Uh, when you go into executive session, just come get me and I'll get the camera out of there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is coming back to the board as uh, it was on uh, behalf of Waterstone. Uh, Scarborough LLC, Jones and Beach Engineers is requesting district approval for amendment to their approved plan. In December of 2014, the trustees approved the uh, proposal to connect and discharge into the sewer the wastewater from the proposed development at 700 Galley Boulevard. The two 2014 proposal consisted of three buildings containing a total of <coughs> approximately 113 1,500 square feet. The main anchor retail building of approximately 106,000 square feet was built, but the two smaller buildings were not. At the time, the capacity reserve fee was paid for all three buildings as uh, presented below. At this time, Waterstone uh, Scarborough LLC is requesting approval of the amended plan, which depicts replacing the two smaller buildings with one 8,242 square foot building. The estimated wastewater flow is uh, 2,792 gallons per day, which is well above our minimum requirements for a building of this size and below the previous requested flow. I rec recommend approval with the following conditions. The average daily flows of the lot will be as previously 
per group of the 14,414 gallons per day, typical sanitary waste. Any future flows in excess of these flows are subject to additional approvals. No capacity reserve fees are due at this time. The capacity fee uh, for the original approval was paid on June 25th, 2015. Also, a service sale have detectable underground utility marketing tape. Um, the cost of district standards. No food service establishment shall be permitted without additional district approvals. Uh, final plan signed and stamped by a license, uh, licensed engineer submitted prior to issuance of the permit. Uh, to a permit is required. Um, and that trial, the record drawings be provided, that uh, record card drawings stamped, um, paper copies be submitted to the district upon completion. Questions? No approval of these additions set forth by the superintendent. Your second. Second. Second by Judy. Thank you. All those in favor? No. Oh. <laughs> no folks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item G is the budget summary. We want budget summaries included in the packet. I recommend approval. Any questions on the budget summary? Second. Second the motion. Second. Judy seconds. All those in favor? None opposed. Thank you. Public comments. There is no one left in the public comment. Uh, trustee comments? Sure. Um, I just got back from Florida. Had a wonderful vacation, but when I hit Maine, when we hit Maine, we said, we're home. There's no place better than the state of Maine. There's no place as beautiful as the state of Maine. And I always realize why I've lived in Cumberland County my entire life. When I go away and I come back home, that's why we live here. Glad you're back. Thank you. Right, sweaters back. Yes. Okay. Joe? Um, so uh, for me, uh, just again, a uh, great annual report and uh, excellent job with the audit. Um, and continue to do good work on behalf of all the workers at the district. Um, for me, I just uh, condolences for the public safety community for uh, Corporal Cole that uh, shot one of duty this mm -hmm. week. Um, and otherwise than that, there's something else, but I can't remember right now. So uh, thank you, and thanks for your work. Cheers. Yeah, I like all those comments. <coughs> thanks uh, to Wendy, the staff, Dave, for another successful year of audits, getting through that process. Thank you very much for all your hard work with that. Thank you for, to, to the representative uh, from the Lead Associates for coming and presenting tonight. And uh, again, thanks to all the staff for everything they do. Another great month down at the district. Great. Thanks, Jason. Uh, I guess I guess I echo. Shall I? Can I just say one thing? Yes, you can. I just want to uh, express my condolences to uh, Costello. Peter Costello is a long-term uh, uh, trustee for the district. I got to know him quite well, and his wife uh, just recently passed away of many years. So uh, they were married. I think they were married for seventy. Seventy-two. Seventy-three years. Long time. Peter. Yeah, I share it. I share, and I'm sure the trustees do. And we did send, we sent, uh, uh, we sent flowers on behalf of the district, um, and uh, and uh, sad for Peter and what he's going through, and just uh, express my condolences to him also. I would like to thank um, Wendy and David uh, for working well with uh, the auditors. And I think that, again, it's successful day-to-day um, -day operations and bookkeeping, record keeping, that makes for a successful audit of this type. We had no management letter from the auditor, which I think is a, is a a nice vote of confidence uh, again for our administrative staff. Um, 
So I'm really happy about that. Just want to thank you both for continuing great efforts on behalf of the, of the district. And uh, we hope that our users are encouraged by hearing good things from you on this. And um, that's all I've got for comments uh, this evening. Um, I would yeah, like a... I have one more. Okay, you remembered. I did, yes. Uh, um, and I just wanted to thank you. We've recently gotten some uh, public uh, correspondence and just to appreciate the fact that they are reaching out and they're listening to them. Whether it's been about uh, the five point stuff or, or uh, with recently the uh, South Point Tower. So uh, I just want to extend. Thank you for reaching out. Uh, so we need a motion to adjourn to executive session for a personnel matter per Title I, Section 405, Maine Revised Statutes, statutes annotated, uh, not to return, not to return to uh, business session. So moved. Second. All in favor? All right, we are adjourned.